All right. Well, I'd like to go ahead and uh, go through the infinite square well one more time. Um, obviously, uh, you could just watch the first video a second time to get another look at it, but I figured it'd be better if I just record another version because it's possible I may talk my way through it slightly differently or uh, show steps in a different way. And so for something that's both very important, the infinite square well as a problem is an extremely important example for quantum mechanics, but also that can be very complicated if you're not used to questions like this, if you're not used to going through some fairly significant problems, then it's it's really nice to take it slow, go through the problem over and over and over again, and that's the secret. When I was a student, uh, an undergraduate, taking quantum mechanics for the first time, uh, I was really interested in the subject, but it was obviously different than any other class I'd ever taken. Um, the problems that we worked on took a very, very long time to solve. There weren't like normal physics problems or math problems where, you know, you have the problem and then you work on it and you're done in two minutes or five minutes. We had homework problems that would take two or three hours to solve, even if we knew what we were doing. And the only way to get to the point where you really have it down, where, you know, you're going to be on a test with a blank sheet of paper, and you can reproduce the steps and the method to solving these types of problems uh, in a, you know, reasonable amount of time, is to really practice and rewrite and go over it over and over and over again, even if you're bored with it. But if you do it, then you're not going to have problems when it comes time to actually be required to, to reproduce this stuff. So anyway, this is second time going through Infinite Square Well. I hope it helps the understanding. I hope if there were any steps that seemed confusing last time will become a little more clear this time. But anyway, here we go. So the infinite square well is that problem where we're given a potential. So this is potential versus x. And a potential is uh, everywhere less than zero. So here's zero. And here is A, let's say. The potential is infinite. Okay. So that means at zero and to the left, you basically have a wall, and that wall is infinitely high. And then the same goes for A. At A and everything to the right of A, you have a wall that's infinitely high. But in between zero and A, the potential is zero. So you have like a floor. And the way we mathematically show or write this particular potential, V as a function of X, is what's called piecewise. And so this potential is broken up into three pieces or three regions. The first is the potential is infinity when X is less than zero. So everything to the left of zero is infinity. The potential in region two is zero, and that region is between zero and A. So when X is between zero and A, we're inside the well, we're inside the box, and so our potential is at zero there. And then past A, the third region, we're back again with a wall that's infinitely high. So x greater than a, everything to the right of a, is at infinity. And that is the potential, written piecewise, function for our problem. And now what we want to do is use Schrodinger's equation. And here's Schrodinger's equation. 
minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi with respect to x squared, plus v as a function of x, times psi equals e times psi. This is, of course, the time-independent version of Schrodinger's equation. And now what we want to do, which is true of all quantum mechanical problems using Schrodinger's equation, is we want to take the potential for our particular problem and plug it in to Schrodinger's equation, and then we're going to be left with a differential equation to solve. And the thing we're going to try to solve for is psi, the wave function. Well, the way you do that when the potential is not just a single thing but is piecewise defined is for each piece, you're going to have a Schrodinger's equation for that piece. So, in this case, we're going to have three regions. In region 1, and region 1, of course, is over here. Region 2 is here, and region 3 is out here on the right. So for region 1, we're going to have minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi with respect to x squared. And now the v for region 1 is, of course, infinity. Infinity times psi equals e times psi. So that's what region 1 looks like. Region 2... Again, we have minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi with respect to x squared, plus v, but v for region 2 is 0, so that term goes away, and we have equals e times psi. And then finally, region 3. Looks exactly like region 1, minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi with respect to x squared plus infinity times psi equals e times psi. So there we go. We now have our problem stated. Three regions, each region has Schrodinger's equation, and so we need to solve Schrodinger's equation for each region. Well, first thing is, because we have this infinity in region 1 and region 3, we automatically know the answer to these problems for region 1 and 3. The only way we can solve this where there's an infinity in the problem is if psi is equal to 0. Because if you have something times infinity, that's always going to be infinity unless that something is 0. The only way you can ever get an answer out of this differential equation is if psi itself is just 0. Then you lose the infinities. So the only one we have to worry about is region 2. Now physically, what does this say? For region 1, the wave function being 0 basically says that the wave function is 0 all over that region. The wave function being 0 basically represents the fact that you will not find the particle there. Because remember, the physical representation of the wave function is if you square the wave function, you get a probability of finding the particle in that region. Well, if the wave function is 0, squaring 0, you get 0. So the probability of finding the particle in region 1 is 0. So all this is saying is because the region 1 is just a big infinite wall, you're never going to find the particle over there. It can't be there. And again, the same for region 3. Region 3 is an infinite wall, or a wall infinitely high. Uh, the wave function is defined to be 0 there, and so the fact that it's 0 in region 3 means the probability of finding the particle in region 3 is 0. Obviously, this is going to apply or imply that the particle must be somewhere in region 2. So that's what we're going to worry about. What does region 2 tell us about the wave function? Region 2. This is the region that is 0 less than x less than a. <coughs> now I write down 
that zero less than x less than a to remind me later on when I have to go do integrals or anything like that that the limits of my integral are not going to be negative infinity to infinity anymore. I'm not looking everywhere. I'm only looking in region 2. So the limits for an integral that are only for region 2 go from 0 to a. So that's going to remind me that later on. But anyway, what do I want to do? I take Schrodinger's equation for region 2, and I'm going to solve it for psi. So let's solve it. What I like to do is I like to get the derivative thing on the left and everything else on the right. So I'm going to say, okay, second derivative of psi with respect to x squared equals minus 2me over h bar squared times psi. All right, so all I did was I took the h bar squared over 2m with the minus sign and I divided it over to the right side. Now, I'm going to say, take this thing in a parentheses, and I'm going to call that thing in a parentheses k squared. Okay. When I do that, this becomes second derivative of psi with respect to x squared equals minus k squared times psi. Now, we've done this before, but again, the, the logic is... I want to find a function psi such that when I take two derivatives, that's what the left says, I get what the right says, and what the right side says is you get the function psi back again, but now it's multiplied by negative some number. k squared is some number, and there's a negative. So I take a function, do two derivatives on it, I get the function exactly back, but now with a negative sign and a number out in front. Well, I already know that this is true when psi is either sine or cosine. Because remember, if it's sine, then I take one derivative, it becomes cosine, and I take another derivative, it becomes minus sine. So I take two derivatives, I get sine back again, but with a negative sign. And if the argument of the function is kx instead of just x, then I also get the k's coming out. Now, because both sine of kx and cosine kx work, then what I'm going to write is what's called the general uh, solution, which is a linear combination of both solutions. So if I know that sine kx is a solution, I could just say, well, it's sine kx. But I also know that cosine kx works. So I could write cosine kx as a solution. But since both could be the solution, I, as a physicist or a mathematician, have to note that the full solution is both sine and cosine. And the way I write it is some amount of the solution, called capital A, is the sine kx form, but some other amount of the solution, called b, is the cosine kx form. Okay. That is the general solution to Schrodinger's equation for this region, which is great. That's really good. The problem is there's a lot of things I don't know here. A is a number, I have no idea what that number is, and b is a number, and I don't really know what that number is. And k, remember k squared is this combination 2me over h bar squared, e, the energy, I don't know what the energy level is, so I, so I don't know what k is either. So I have three unknowns in this solution. Well, I don't want unknowns in my solution, I want to know my solution totally. So at this point, this is when we switch from, now that I've found the solution, the general solution, let's get specific for this particular problem, what is the exact solution? And in order to do that, you have to work on what's called boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are like 
regulations or rules or something like that for your particular problem that restrict what the answer could be. So yeah, in general, you could have this solution, but because of how I started my problem or the, the fancy little um, implementations, uh, the actual solution is very, very specified in a certain way. Kind of like this. You can have a string um, or, a, yeah, let's say a string, a guitar string or something. And the solution could be, how does the guitar string wave? You know, how does it vibrate? Well, the answer is you know, some kind of a wavy function. But the answer, the true answer to a real problem would depend, for instance, on how did you pluck the string? Did you pull it down first and then let go? Did you pull it up first and then let go? How hard did you pull it up? Did you, uh, instead of you know plucking the string up or down, did you tap the string? These are all different ways of starting the problem. The string is the string, and it's going to wave the way it's going to wave, but how you start the wave will make a difference to the actual answer. Those are what's called boundary conditions. And so same thing here. We have a general problem. A particle is placed in this box. But by applying the boundary conditions, we're specifying a certain starting point for how the problem begins. And for this problem, we have two. The first boundary condition is that the value of our wave function when x is equal to zero. This means the value of the wave function at the left side boundary. Remember the boundary is the fact that we have a wall over here at, z, at zero. So we want the value of the wave function when we hit this wall. That's the boundary, that's why it's called boundary condition. So the condition is the value of psi at the left side wall is equal to zero. Okay, that's nice. I'm just saying, if you look at the wave function for this picture, notice on the left it's all zero, because I told you the particle can't be inside the wall. But it could be anything at once inside the box. But what I'm specifying is that point right at the wall, the wave function is defined to be at zero there. Now it could go up and start to wave in here. That's fine, but at the wall, it's zero. Okay. The second boundary condition, very similarly, is the value of the wave function evaluated at x is equal to a. That's the right wall over here. When x is equal to the right side wall position, Again, the wave function will be defined to be zero. So those are our two boundary conditions. Now we're going to use them with our particular wave function, psi, to try to get some information. So, first boundary condition. Psi, when x is equal to zero, is equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, well what was psi? We had psi, which is now zero. I'm telling you, psi is equal to zero. And now I'm going to write this thing, but everywhere I see x, I'm going to place what x is equal to for our boundary condition. So I have a sine k times zero, because I'm told x is equal to zero here plus b cosine of k times zero. All right. Now what? Well, zero equals sine of k times zero. k times zero, of course, is just zero. So what is sine of zero? Sine of zero is just zero. Now what about the second? We have b times cosine of k times zero is cosine of zero 
cosine of zero is just one. So here we go. I've got zero equals b. Aha! Uh -huh. There's the first piece of information we have from our boundary condition. If it's true that our wave function must be zero at the left wall, the only way this can be true is if b, capital B, is equal to zero. So now what do I have? I now have my new wave function, psi, is a sine kx. But now the second term, the b cosine kx, is just zero, because b is zero. So this is all I have now. All right, so I've got more information. I've specified my solution a little more. But I'm not done. I have a second boundary condition to do. Psi, when x is equal to a, must be zero. Okay, so again, we do it. Here's our psi right here. So I'm going to rewrite that, but everywhere I see psi, psi is zero. And everywhere I see x, x is a. So zero equals a sine k times a. All right, so what does this tell me? Well, the left side is always zero. What about the right side? Well, the right side, if I want the right side to be zero, there's two ways that this can happen. We can either have capital A is zero, then no matter what sine is, zero times the sine is always zero. Or sine KA must be zero. Right? This is basically saying 0 is equal to a times b, right? Well, two numbers multiplied by each other equals 0 is true if a is 0 or b is 0 or both are 0. That's all I'm saying here. We have a times sine ka is equal to 0. That's true if a is equal to 0 or sine ka is equal to 0. Well, capital A being equal to 0 is dumb. Because if capital A is equal to zero, then look at what our wave function becomes. Psi is zero. And now, for our three regions, all three of our regions, psi will be zero. It's zero in region one and zero in region three because of the original stuff. And now we found out it's zero in region two, too. And all that means is there is no particle anywhere. That's bad. So we know that can't be true. So it can't be capital A is equal to zero. So the only thing it can be is that sine KA is equal to zero. So let's investigate this. When is the function sine of K times A equal to zero? We want it to always be zero. A, this little a here, is a number. It's where is this wall located, the two meter mark or the three meter mark. So that's just a number. The only time sine function is equal to zero is sine of something is equal to zero when alpha, that something, is some number times pi. Right? Sine of zero is zero. Sine of pi is zero. Sine of two pi is zero. Sine of three pi is zero. So for n is zero, one, two, and so on, any integer, the thing inside the sine function must be some integer times pi. If it is, then it's always zero, no matter what. So, for sine ka to be zero, it must be that k is n pi over a. Right? Look at it. Sine of ka must be zero. And I know that the thing in the, uh, in the argument, k times a, must be n pi. Because the only time sine is equal to zero always is if it's sine of some number times pi. So ka, the thing in the sine, must be some number times pi. Now I just solve for k, and I get k is equal to n pi over a. Right? That's how I got it.
So now I know. Good. This is perfect. I now know k is n pi over a. That's what this boundary condition has told me. The first boundary condition told me b is equal to 0. The second boundary condition told me that k, little k, must be n with some integer times pi over a. So now what do I have for my wave function? Sine now is capital A times sine of k, which is n pi over a, times x. That's my wave function now. So again, I've gotten a more specific answer to my question. I started with the general solution, which is this one underlined here. But then applying the boundary conditions, which is specifying more about my problem, the second term goes away, because b is equal to 0 from the first condition. And then we know more about the k from the second boundary condition. So now we have our wave function really, really nicely. Another thing we know is that if you look at what this says k is, this says k is n pi over a. But we had something before about k. Look right here. Here we have another definition for k. k squared is 2me over h bar squared. So, oops, let me do this in blue. So if k is n pi over a, but it's also the square root of 2me over h bar squared, Right? So this red circle tells me n pi over a. This red star tells me k squared is 2me over h bar squared. I just put them together. Why do I do that? Because look at what's inside of the square root here. Energy. I could use this equation to calculate the energy of my particle. So first, square both sides. I get n squared pi squared over a squared equals 2me over h bar squared. And I want to solve for e. So you get e is n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. There's something else I know. This tells me for my particle, which is stuck inside of the box, the allowed energies that particle can have is given by this particular equation. Now this is really interesting. If you really look at it and you try to understand what it's telling you, pi is a number, h bar is a number, m, the mass of the particle, a, where the wall is located, all that crap is a bunch of numbers. However, n squared, remember what n was, n is some integer. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It can only have certain values. A can have any value we want. We could place the wall anywhere. So by moving the wall, we could change the energies. And we can make it any energy we want. But if we fix where the wall is, we can't have any possible energy. All we can do is change what n is equal to. So we could go from n is equal to 0. Okay, so energy is 0. Then we could say n is equal to 1. If that's true, then the energy is pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. But then if n is equal to 2, then we have 4 times pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. But notice, there's no energy between those two. We have an energy level and then 4 times the energy level. But there's not 3 times, there's not 2 times, there's not 1.75 times. So there's this quantization, this limit to the energy can be this number, or it could be this number, or it could be that number. But it cannot be something in between them. This is the heart of quantum mechanics. Energy is quantized and can only have very specific values. All right, well, we're almost done. The only problem is we still have one unknown sitting in our wave function. We don't know what this capital A is. 
This capital A is really bothering us. But there's one more thing we can do, and that thing is called normalization. Normalization is using the fact that if you square the wave function, it tells you about the probability of finding the particle. Then it must be that if we look everywhere in the universe, we will find the particle somewhere. If it exists, of course. So, what that says is, if I take the integral over all space, negative infinity to infinity, of psi times psi, now this is the fancy complex number version of squaring psi, so I square psi, and I look between negative infinity and infinity, then the probability of finding the particle there must be 100%. That's what this says. It can't be 200%. It can't be 50%. We know that under the assumption the particle exists, the probability of finding the particle somewhere must be 1. We could use this to define what this capital A will be in order for probabilities to make sense. And that's normalizing the wave function. So let's normalize the wave function. What do we have? For our particular problem, we have the integral. Now, remember what I said. All this time, we're in region 2. So we have the limits of my integral are not from negative infinity to infinity anymore. They're only where region 2 is located, which is between 0 and A. So, integral from 0 to A of psi star, that's the complex conjugate of psi. Here's psi right now. Well, thankfully, this psi is not complex, so it's just whatever psi says. A sine n pi x over A. That's psi star. Psi, of course, is the same thing. A sine n pi x over A. Dx. So there's integral of psi star psi must be equal to 1. And now we have a math problem. This math equation tells me, uh, or can tell me, what must capital A be for this to be true? Well, of course, A, this is just a number, so we can take it out of the integral. So we have A squared, integral is 0 to A, of sine times sine is sine squared, n pi x over a dx is equal to 1. All right. Well, as we saw last time, what we can do is use the fact that sine squared of kx, or sine squared of something times x, is equal to, well, we could do this. Take the sine squared, and remember that sine squared of n pi x over a is the same as one half of one minus cosine of two n pi x over a. Okay. This is just a, a, a trig substitution. Sine squared of something is one half minus cosine of two times that something over two. So I take that and I plug it into my integral. A squared integral zero to a. Uh, one half times one is one half. Let's do it like this. One half dx minus integral 0 to a, 1 half cosine 2n pi x over a dx. Right, sine squared is two terms, this term and this term. So the first term is the first integral, the second term is the second integral. I took the sine squared of something, it's too complicated to do, Turn it into regular stuff. 
using this substitution. And then I just use the fact that the integral of a plus b is the integral of a plus the integral of b. So now I have two integrals to do. But that's okay. a squared times. Integral of one half dx is one half of x evaluated from zero to a. Okay, so that first term is easy. Next term, we have minus one half. Okay, integral of cosine of something times x is one over the something. So we can do, uh, let's say, a over 2n pi sine of 2n pi x over a. All evaluated from 0 to a equals 1. All right. So now I have my two terms. Let me evaluate a squared times. All right. We have x over 2, where x can be a or 0. So it's a over 2 minus 0 over 2. Okay, that's fine. Next term, we have minus a over 4n pi sine of 2n pi a over a, so that's sine of 2, sorry, 2n pi, and then minus, but minus this minus here becomes a plus, a over 4n pi, now we have sine of 0. All right, so we evaluated everything. The first term, x can be a, so it's a over 2, minus x can be 0, 0 over 2. All right, the next term has a minus out in front. One half of a over 2n pi is a over 4n pi. Sine of blah, 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 x is a. So the a's cancel, and we get sine of 2n pi. Finally, we have minus, because we go to the other side. So minus minus is plus, a over 4n pi, sine of blah, 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 0, so it's sine of 0. All right, well, first of all, sine of 0 is 0, so this term, nothing. Sine of 2n pi, well, remember what n, n is any integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, so n times 2 times pi is always 0, so this term is 0 as well. 0 over 2, that's 0. So what do we have? We have a squared times a over 2 is equal to 1. Well, let's move up here. a squared times a over 2 must be equal to 1. Solving this for capital A, we divide over the a over 2, and so we get a squared equals 2 over a. So, a must be square root of 2 over a. And now we got it. We have now normalized our wave function. We now know what capital A is. So, here's our two things. Psi is capital A, which is square root of 2 over a. Sine n pi x over a. Any energy n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2 m a squared. And we have now solved the infinite square. Well, by solving it, I mean, number one, I got the wave function. That's the number one most important thing to do. We have the wave function. We've calculated all the unknowns in the wave function, the capital A, the capital B, the K, all that stuff. We use boundary condition and normalization condition, and we have everything we can know about the wave function. That is going to allow us, for next time, to start asking questions about where will the particle be, or what's the probability of this, or what's the probability of that. 
The other thing we know is the energy. What are the allowed energy levels? That's given by this. So N can be 0, or 1, or 2, or 3, and so on. So for instance, the first energy level, E0, is 0. The next one is when N is equal to 1. So that's pi squared, h bar squared, over 2ma squared. The next one is when, e, uh, when N is equal to 2. So 2 squared is 4. 4 times pi squared, h bar squared, over 2ma squared. And then when E is equal to 3, or N is equal to 3, and so on. But notice, the energy can be this number or this number, but it can't be anything in between. And same here, it can be this number or four times that number, but it can't be anything in between. So there are allowed energy levels for this particle. And what it should be reminding you is, if you think about a nucleus and you have the little electrons orbiting around, you have different orbitals that the electrons can be in. And in order for an electron to jump from one orbital to another, it's going to have different energies. One energy allows it to be on this orbit, a different energy allows it to be on this orbit, but you'll never find the electron between those two orbits. It can't be there. It must be this or that, and that's all it can be. This is what quantum mechanics is all about. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I hope going through it again, uh, slightly differently, wording it maybe a little bit differently, has made it a little more clear what the steps are. The technique should be fine. You should talk your way through this problem, okay? What do you do? How do you solve the infinite square? Well, you should be able to tell me. You should be able to verbalize. Well, first, define your potential. And then for each of the regions in the problem, you write down Schrodinger's equation for that potential. You then solve Schrodinger's equation for the wave function. You'll have a general solution. You take that general solution and you apply boundary conditions. And those boundary conditions will start to define some of the unknowns in your general solution, and you get to a final wave function. You then normalize the wave function to get the last piece of information you need. Once you have that, you have your specific wave function for your problem, as well as the allowed energy levels. Okay? Now, to do it is a little bit more complicated because you have to be able to do the math. You have to be able to solve the differential equation. You have to be able to do the integral to find the normalization. Yeah, that's a little harder, but it can be done. You just saw me do it. You need to be able to do both. If you can't word your way through it, you'll never be able to write down the math to do it. Get the technique down. Tell it like a story how you would actually solve it. Once you have that clear in your mind, then start to do the specifics. Can I actually write down the differential equation and do I know how to solve the differential equation? Once I can do that, can I do the normalization? Can I do this integral? If I don't know how to do the integral, I need to look up how to calculate the integral. Because if you're going to go to graduate school or if you're going to pursue physics at a higher level, you have to be able to do these integrals. There's no cheating it. There's no, well, I'm just going to go my life without being able to do higher level math. Well, then that's not what physics is about. Physicists can do math. Now, we may not do it exactly as a mathematician would do it. We may have shortcuts and we may have ways of thinking about it that may be different. That's fine. But you should be able to think your way through these problems. So practice this. Over and over again, you should be able to wake up at 2.30 in the morning, be given a blank sheet of paper, and reproduce this before the final exam. Because I already said, this is going to be a major problem on your final exam. You already know it's going to be there, so you better be used to doing this. 
But anyway, practice it, practice it, practice it, and I promise you it'll be very, very clear eventually. And it's nice. It's nice to be able to be given a difficult, complicated, complex problem and know deep down that you can solve it. It's a very good feeling to have. So practice and uh, until next time.